1 Thessalonians chapter 1, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Brother Fry, I am so thankful for you being here. That was wonderful. And I'm looking forward to tonight. Amen. Where he just gets uh, unleashed. Just a little more time to sing and maybe testify some more. Preaching. You never know what will come out. It would be great. It would be fantastic. And, and uh, you say, Pastor, why are you doing that? Because last year we did this it was a very similar thing. An end of the summer type of concert. Just for God's people to enjoy some great music. And I believe that God uses music. He does. I see it in the scriptures. And I want you to have good music. And uh, he's got his table set up there. And he's got some CDs and some other things. And uh, uh, are we still in CD time? Is that what you got? Or do you have something else? Flash drives and thumb drives. He's got all kinds of drives. Amen. Thumbs and flashes and everything else. And so uh, you talk to Brother Williams. You don't understand that techie stuff. And he'll, he'll explain it to you. Okay, it'd be great. Wonderful. First Thessalonians chapter four, chapter one, excuse me, and um, verse four says, "Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Election. I don't know exactly why God had brought this out this week, but I couldn't get away from this word election." People ask me spiritual questions. I'm the pastor. They come to me. They challenge me on things. Sometimes they ask me things. And I've noticed that folks get to this word of election and they get hung up a little bit. The election of God. Now when we use the word election, we're thinking of 2024. There's a big election. Right? Isn't that how we use that word? Election. We've got a big presidential election every November in the primaries and all that we, we always do. But, uh, but here, this November, you have the opportunity to choose the candidate that you believe will be best suited to run the executive powers of the United States of America. You have that privilege. You have that wonderful ability as a citizen of the United States to go cast your vote. You have a voice. I say amen to that. I love America, and I love that we have a voice. Who will you choose? Now, I'm not asking for you to call it out, okay? Oh, my, he's getting political. No, let, let's be real. I'm supposed to be a Christian when I go to, the, go, go to vote, just like I am today. Who are you going to choose? Are you going to choose someone who uh, uh, either is, is, is righteous or unrighteous? Who are we going to choose? I'm not saying that, the, that one is not a sinner and one is not a, another sinner. And there's other people that run and we all know these things. I'm not trying to go down that road. But I am going down the road that we ought to be in our Bibles and understanding who God is and what He desires for us. I believe God wants us in America to be righteous. And when I look at the candidates, I have to acknowledge before God that it is clear to me that there's, there, is, there are certain policies and certain agendas and certain things in this presidential election that God is not in favor of. Now that's what we often think about in this word election, election. and rightfully so. We ought, to, uh, we ought to go cast our vote. We ought to have a voice. But we ought to as Christians. Yeah. Reading stuff where, well, what, what business does a, a pastor have talking about political things and all this such? Uh, civics is an important part of this country, and I believe we're supposed to be Christians all the time, not just sometimes. Yeah. Amen. When I start talking to people about this, this business of, uh, 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 of who I'm going to vote for and all that, I don't check my Christianity at the door. No, because God expects me to do right all the time. And, and who, uh, who, what am I voting for? Not just who. We get so wrapped around the names and we get all caught up in names and popularity and all this. What are you voting for? It's time we get in our Bibles. Say, God, what pleases you? And when I cast my vote in November, what am I voting for? And is that pleasing to you? Amen. 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 Now, in the word election here in the Bible, verse 4, when it says election of God, 
It's a Greek word, and I, I'll tell you, I pronounce it wrong because I'm not a great uh, linguistist, but it, it's E K L O G E. Okay, I believe it's ekloge, but I could be wrong there. The word in the Greek there, ekloge, it means chosen. Now, when I understand that, I've got to read this verse. And I say here, it says, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your being chosen of God. Wait a minute. Hmm. Pastor, what are, you, what are you saying here? God chose us? Isn't that what it says? Amen. Pastor, are you changing? What are you doing here? You know, where are you going with this? Is not all of Scripture in, inspired by God? Is not all of it right? Amen. That my Bible says here that we were, what's it say? Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, your being chosen of God. Did God choose us? Yes. yes, he did. Did I choose God? Yes, I did. Why, why should we get hung up on the fact that God chose us? And why should that skew my salvation or my idea or my philosophy or, or, or anything like that? My doctrine. Why should it mess it up? Isn't it okay that God chose me? Yes, it is. It's a wonderful, comforting thought when I think that God chose me. I love that. The problem is, is that sometimes we, get all, we read something and we don't fully comprehend it or we don't use all of the Bible. We don't use all of the Bible to define itself. And we start throwing out other verses because we get hung up on a word that we're in our man's wisdom and our man's thinking. Yeah, in our flesh, we start going astray because we stop letting the Holy Spirit bring up other scriptures that we know and we know well. If I go down this track, now let's just, let's just talk about what some people are thinking and what kind of comes into your mind when you start thinking about this word election. When, when we start thinking of, okay, if we're chosen of God, God chose us. He, he picked us out. He chose us. He, there was a selection process here and he chose us. But if we go down that route and we start thinking, well, if God chose these people to be saved, doesn't that mean that God chose these people to be unsaved? Wait a minute. And there's folks that are getting hung up on this. We get hung up on this and we get deceived because we take Scripture out of context of the rest of Scripture and we start going down a track because, ooh, this is fresh, this is new, this is something different. Let me go talk to my friends about this. Ooh, Wait a minute, maybe we should go and compare it to the rest of Scripture and let God define it and let God explain it to us. All of Scripture is right, and even when it says the election of God when God chooses us. If God chose some to be saved and some not to be saved, doesn't the Bible say why uh, broad is the way, why, wide is the gate? Doesn't it say that many people are going to go to hell? Does it not say that? Why would God create man? Why would He create mankind if, the, if there's a larger majority going to hell? Does that make any sense? The fact is that the devil wants to take God's Word and it, he wants to manipulate it and get you off on your own train of thought away from the rest of the Word and take one little word or one little nugget or one verse out of Scripture and, and skew it in your mind so he can deceive you and keep you from what God's trying to teach us. Has he not done that before? Hmm. The first time we see him talking in the Bible. What happened? He's talking to Eve. What did he say? He said he got Eve to doubt the word of God. Half God said. And he got Eve off. Well, you're going to be like God. You're going to eat of that tree. You're going to know it all. And you're going to be like a God. And he got her off on an, a fleshly, foolish train of thought so that she took of the fruit. Is that not what happened? That's exactly what happened. When I read the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, before I end up scaring you a little bit, okay? Your pastor's not changing. I'm trying to teach you the Word of God and where this fits in and how it works. 
The election of God. Because I've seen so many getting contrary and going off and running and chasing the foolish doctrines of this world. The philosophy of man. When I read the Bible, I do not read throughout the Scriptures and come to the conclusion that God chooses some people to not be saved. I don't read that. My Bible says something different. It says God is love. He wants all of us to be saved. I get to the book of Isaiah when I'm reading this. I get to the book of Isaiah and I see, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. You know what that means? That means we have a choice. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured. That's what he says in Isaiah. He goes on in verse uh, chapter 45. He says, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. What does that mean? If you want to get saved, you've got to look unto God. Amen. Amen. That's, what it is. That's what he's saying. John chapter 3, explaining that very thought. John chapter 3. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have, what's it say here, have eternal life. That's verse 15. Have eternal life. He goes on to John 3, 16, okay, the next verse. He's talking to Nicodemus here. And he says that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There are some people in this world that believe that God, the election of God, is that God chose us to be saved, but there's a whole bunch of people that He didn't choose to be saved. That is contrary to Scripture. That's a false doctrine. And the devil's trying to deceive you to get you off track so that you won't be what you're supposed to be. And I'm going to get to that in just a moment. I'm going to get to that here. Amen. Now, we had a lot of music, and I understand I'm watching the clock, but church, we need to be taught the Scriptures and false doctrines that are not found in Scripture so that we can do right and we can be. We not get skewed on our, our idea of, of, of salvation, we, 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 and we still be soul winners at heart. Amen. Amen. Now, when we get into this now, understand the Bible also says in Acts chapter 16, it says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It doesn't say that, well, because God likes you, you're saved. It doesn't say that. It says believe. Amen. Okay? Turn with me over to Romans 10, please. Romans chapter 10. This is a very uh, familiar passage of Scripture that oftentimes we as soul winners use when leading folks to Christ. Romans chapter 10. But I'd like to see the context of the verses that we often quote. And see what God is saying here. Romans chapter 10, please. We're just going left from where we were. If you hit Acts, you went too far. Romans chapter 10. Now look with me, please, if you would, in verse 8. Verse 8. Watch this now. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Wait a minute, faith, faith, believing, it's nigh unto you. You, It's nigh unto you, but there must be more. Verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. Remember the word, the word of faith is nigh unto your mouth. Look at verse 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That means we got to believe it and we got to ask for it. Verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Well, what are you saying, preacher? I mean, God chose us, yes. Yes, God chose us. But the Bible also says that God said, whosoever will can be saved. So if I see over here that God chose us, And I see over here that whosoever will can be saved. There must be something there that works together. Yes? Yes. And that's where we get a little bit, wait a minute. Woo. Man, help me here. Come on now. You know what I was doing while I was preparing this? God wanted me to preach on this. And I'm going, Lord, are you sure? (laughs) 
That's a hard topic for me. I know what I believe, but I got to be able to explain it and I got to be able to preach it and I got to be able to tell the truth without getting people confused. The Lord said, preach it and trust me. Amen. Election of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The very last uh, chapter of the Bible says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is athirst come. Come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Yes, God chooses us, but we still have a choice. All right, preacher. Okay, I'm getting it now. Well, where? How do you put all this together? Listen, I already talked about let Scripture explain Scripture. When we have a verse that we don't fully understand, we must compare it to other Scripture and see if God said this over here, and it's true. Then God, when he's saying it over here, if this is also true, because all the Bible is, yes, pure, yes, without error, we believe that. Psalm chapter 12 says that, okay, that is pure, without error, okay, yes, God God moved in the heart of men to, to pen it down, but God is the one that inspired it, it's pure. He will also preserve it, praise God for it, and Psalm 12 teaches us that. But if that is the case, then God choosing us is also true, just like we have a choice. How do we do this? We must compare Scripture with Scripture. Help here. Um, just going to give you a couple examples today. Diamonds. Much you ladies got diamonds on. You like your diamonds? How many of you have a hard time picking up your hand? Anybody? No? Okay. Some of you say, no, nah, it's little, but maybe someday it'll get big. It'll grow. I'm praying it'll grow. Whatever, okay? But listen, do, do diamonds just pop out of the ground and, and look like they got planted on your, on your, on your ring there? Does it, do they look like that when they're just in the ground? Absolutely not. What does that mean? That means they have to be cut and shaped. But here's the thing. Did you know that diamonds are the hardest natural material on earth? How do you cut the hardest thing ever? I mean, there's nothing else that's harder. So how do you cut it? You cut it with itself. Because if you were to take, go down to Brother Yours's garage and find a saw in there and say, yeah, I'm going to go at this thing. That saw ain't going to hold up. You with me? You follow me now? You've got to use a diamond to cut a diamond. You've got to use Scripture to define and explain Scripture. The Bible is perfect. It doesn't change. It's forever settled in heaven. And God said it's pure and it's right. So we must use that Scripture to define Scripture. Okay, you're with me here in Romans 10. Let's go to Romans 11, please. Romans 11. Look at verse 1, please. Look at verse 1. I know I'm doing a little bit of teaching, but I also believe that God's bringing out preaching on this, and we're going to get where we're going in just a moment. Romans chapter 11, verse 1. The Bible says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and have digged down their altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? Verse 4, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Praise God for that. We're not alone. Verse 5, Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Whoa, preacher, you're getting a little bit deeper there. A remnant according to the election of grace. Are you saying that there's a small, a remnant means a small group of people, a remainder of people. Are you saying there's a remainder of people today because God chose it to be that way? Wait a minute. What's going on here? What does this mean? The Bible says here he foreknew them. We start talking about the foreknowledge of God, and man, we can get off on a talking track there. 
Wow, God knew everything from the beginning. And he knew who was going to be saved and what. Wait a minute, what? And we're talking about the choice of God. Now you're getting me off, off base a little bit. This word of election here, even, verse 5, this election of grace still means a choice. But here it's an election of grace. Follow me on this now. Election of grace. That means God chose what? Grace. He chose grace. God looked down on the world and He said, I so love the world that I'm going to extend my grace to the world. Is it so hard to think that God chose me and I chose Him at the same time? Is that so hard? I I chose Marie to be my wife. Did you know that? I chose it. I remember. I, man, it was kind of like now. I was getting all, I was all warm inside. I was, whoo, whew. Home, I went home. Dad, I told Dad, I said, I got to pick out a ring. I got to do this thing. I got to pick out a ring. Went up to Hagerstown. Was shopping around a little bit. Found a ring. I said, whoo. All right, got that taken care of. Man, I chose her. And I dropped to a knee and I said, would you marry me, baby? Right? I mean, I was just, I was in there. I tell you that I tell you that story another time. But anyways, I had this perfect scene set up: the, the coast of California, the sun setting out on the water, all of that. It was cloudy and rainy that day. The beach, the beach was gone, high tide. It was terrible. But I still asked her to marry me. It was awesome, and that's what we remember. Amen. Moving on. But listen, I chose Marie. and she's my wife. Did she come into this, re- this relationship kicking and screaming? Ah! Absolutely not. No, she also chose me. I made a choice and so did she. Is that hard to understand? It's not when we think about a marriage relationship. She could have easily said, I'm out of here. Look at where you chose to ask me to marry you. I mean, it's raining and it's dreary and it's cloudy and this is awful. I'm out of here. No, she said, Absolutely, honey. Woo! Put it on there, baby. You with me now? Amen. Hallelujah. And get this. Get this. At, when I asked her to marry me, uh, the, we, she had a little, this is before like, you know, Apple, iPhones and all that. I mean, we're old. Okay, so this back a while, we, we did camera, right? We had to get out this big thing like video cameras or like this, you know. We had, she had this little camera in her purse. You know, I don't know. I think it was anyways, but she goes to get that out. It's like, we should have a picture to remember this. She gets that out of her purse and she, oh, so look, at, the camera's broken. I don't know if she got so excited when I asked her to marry me, if she was just whipping her purse around or what. I don't know what happened, but the camera was broken. We don't even have a picture of when we got engaged. So the restaurant had this like ketchup bottle that was about this big in glass. We went to a fancy place and it had this ketchup bottle this big. And we said, we're going to take that. And that's our memory of getting, getting engaged. <laughs> this, this little ketchup bottle is this big. Like it. So we took that. And anyways, moving on. Okay. Listen. Let me get back on track here before it gets too late. Watch this now. God chose to give grace, to extend grace to everyone. He chose that. In 1 Timothy, it says this, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. That's what the Scripture says. So some people say, well, well, God only extended His grace to those that He knew were going to accept Him as Savior. That's not what my Bible says. My Bible says the opposite of that. It says He extended His grace to everybody. He wanted everybody to be saved. For, who, he said, for He's not willing that any should perish, right? That's what Peter penned down. He's he, walking with Christ. He knew that. He chose to give us grace. What's that mean? That means He made it possible. He made it possible. We know the Scripture in Ephesians 2, do we not? For by grace are ye saved through faith, right? Grace is God's part. Faith is our part. 
God chose, and then I, and then I made the choice. I, listen, I've heard this. Brother Williams, you've probably heard this as well. I've heard people say, well, I've always been saved. That's not what my Bible says. My Bible says that I'm a sinner and I've come short of the glory of God. That's what my Bible says. So if I'm going to compare these scriptures, I must understand that though God made a choice to extend grace and that God also chose me, my election of God, I had to make a choice by faith to accept Him. Say, how does all that work? Let's go with me, please. Uh, First Peter. And I'll, about ra- I'll wrap up after this, if God allows me. We'll see how, what the time it is. Amen. We're all right. Praise the Lord. I'm hot and hungry too. Amen. Let's go. Move on. All right? So l- let's let God have His way with this. I'm trying to give you some doctrine here that is in the Word of God that oftentimes we, in our man's philosophy, and our man's way of thinking, and trying to figure out an infinite God. You follow me on that? Finite man trying to figure out an infinite God. We will go wrong. You sit and listen to people try to explain the Trinity for hours and hours and hours. I guarantee you they're going to get off base. You know why? Because it's man's philosophy trying to figure it out. I serve an infinite God and here I am nothing but a worm. I need to acknowledge that and through faith accept what He's given me in His Word. Amen. Amen. First Peter here. Look at this. First Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 2. First Peter chapter 1 verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. That word elect, the root of election. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. There we go. Whoa, preacher. Now you're talking about God knew ahead of time that that He was going to choose you. Is that a problem? That's not a problem for me when I understand who God is, when I get in the Word of God and understand His characters, His his characteristics. Elect is a choice of God. His foreknowledge, He's all-knowing. Watch this now. This is so... I, I was reading and trying to understand, and I'm looking at Scriptures, and God gave me this. Watch this. We operate in finite conditions. We are simple-minded. We, we have time and space. We can't move and interchange between them. We're bound by them. You with me? I am bound here right now. I can't be at home right now because I'm here. You follow me? But I'm right now, 40, age, 40 years of age, right now in the year 2024, I can't go anywhere else. I'm bound by that because I'm a finite creature. We speak in past, present, and future, do we not? We say over here, I was. We come over here, we say, I am. We come over here and we say, I will be. You follow me on that? You know what God does in His omniscience, in His omnipotence, in His omnipresence? You know what He does? He takes all of that and He pulls it right in here to His perfect present tense. And He says, I am that I am. Jesus said this. Remember in John chapter 8, he says, before Abraham was, I am. My God is in the beginning, just like he is right here, right now. And my God's in the future, and he sees the millennial kingdom, and he sees eternity, and he's over in eternity, just like he is right here, right now. That's my characteristics of my God. You're saying, you're getting way off track. Read the Bible, and let's find out who God is. He's, a, he's an infinite God. Now, because of all that, my opinion, you can throw this away. This is my opinion. Brother, Brother Bruce, we, when, when I start saying my opinion, they can throw it away in the wastebasket. It doesn't matter. But I'm going to give you, when I'm trying to wrap my head around this, this is what God gave me. I believe the time that I chose Jesus Christ as my Savior. I was a boy, and I remember being shown the Scriptures. I remember saying, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. And I accepted Jesus as my Savior. I chose God. I believe God at that very moment chose me. You know why? Because He's, he's everywhere all the same time. 
He's in the beginning. He's in the end. He's not bound by time. And I don't think it's wrong for God before the creation of the world to look forward right there in my mind, look forward in time and say, He's choosing me. I choose Him. I don't have a problem with that because I know who my God is. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord for that. God made it possible for you to get saved and you had a choice to choose. Now watch this. This Maybe we'll see if God wants to do this here. Uh, Adeline is down here. My daughter, my oldest. Many of you know Adeline. I love my daughter. Did you know that Mrs. Woolard and I, we wanted to have children? Okay? We wanted to have children. But I could not reach into eternity and choose out that I was going to have a girl, what her facial features were going to look like, how, how, how all of her was going to be put together. I couldn't choose her hair color. I couldn't choose her eye color. I didn't have that ability. But I wanted to have children. Did you know that the moment she was born, whoo, I took her in my arms. Whoo, I said, oh, my little Addie Bell. Whoo. I said, I said, I choose you. I didn't know all of what was coming and everything. I couldn't handpick all those things. But when Adibel was born, I said, I choose you. I gave her a name. You know what name that was? Woolard, because she belongs to me. I said, I'm going to take you home. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to care for you. And you think you're going to get married one day? Well, well let's just sit, wait and see about that. I don't know. <laughs> you with me now? I chose her when she was born. But I, couldn't, I didn't go into time and pick out all those other things. I'm a finite creature. Say, so what you had, you had a part in her being here. Yes, I did. God has a beautiful way and praise God for that. God gave her to me and I made the choice. You know what? There's families and maybe you're part of some and maybe you've heard of some that don't choose that. And they cast people away and they forsake their own. And they do that kind of thing. And it's awful. But I know that I chose my Adibel. My Adeline. She belongs to me. And some of you guys think you're going to come after her. You better got another thing coming. Okay? Don't be worried about what I'm packing. Be worried about these guns right here. All right. Moving on. If you're going to get elected, if you're going to get elected, you've got to be a candidate first. Think about that. If you're going to get elected, you've got to be a candidate first. What does that mean? Well, in the United States of America, help me church, they have to be a natural born citizen, yes? To, to, to be a president of the United States, they've got to be at least, if I'm not mistaken here, 35 years of age. And to be a president of the United States, they have to have lived within the country at least 14 of those years, if I've got, if I've got my history correct. There's some requirements there. You, you follow me? To be elected, you've got to be within the requirements, so you've got to be a candidate first. Okay, I could talk about that for a long time, but we'll move on. Okay, now watch this now. If you're going to get saved... If you're going to be the chosen of God, you've got to be, a, you've got to be a, a candidate. Listen here, listen here. You've got to recognize your condition. Look at the Bible and read the Bible. What, what, what does God do for those that are humble? He giveth grace unto the humble, but He rejects the proud, does He not? We've got to get humble and we've got to say, I'm a sinner. You got to be a candidate first in order to be saved. Yes, we got to come to the knowledge of, hey, Jesus died on the cross. He took my place and he rose from the dead. He's alive and he can save me. I got to trust that. I got to believe that. But here it is. You also got to trust that it's only Jesus and it's not Jesus plus something else. Amen. Brother Fry was talking about that in Sunday school. It's not Jesus and, a, and church membership. Church membership is a good thing. It's a right thing. Biblically, I believe you should be a part of a church after you get saved. But salvation comes first, and it's only through Jesus. Did you know my grandmother got saved in the hospital? She was dying of cancer, and she didn't have an opportunity to get baptized or to join the church. 
She's still in heaven. Why? Because it's Jesus alone. Now, here's my message. I'm going to give you a couple points and I'll be done. I'm going to close my Bible to help you there. All right. The dangers of being wrong on this, this idea of election. Here it is. Number one, a contortion of salvation. You say, what does that mean? Contortion, to contort. To be it all twisted up, to skew it, to, dis, to be distorted. When we get off on this doctrine of election, our, our idea of salvation gets all twisted and mangled in our philosophy. We must look at the scriptures. Let me move right along. Number two, a condemnation of sinners. When I get off on this idea of election, you know what happens in my flesh? Well, God must not have chosen them to be saved. And I start writing people off. You follow me on that? I start writing people off. How about it? When 9-11 took place, okay, I was uh, maybe 30 minutes from here, 35 minutes. I was across the river in Brunswick, Maryland. I was sitting in high school. Remember when that took place? We got a little leery and we go, ooh, and, 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 and some of you say, well, it's rightfully so, but, but still, we started stereotyping people. We started watching people. Did, did, did you want to share the gospel with every Arab and Middle Eastern person and all those folks that, that you understand what I'm saying? Did you want to share the gospel with that part of the world after 9-11 happened immediately? We have to question ourselves because what do we do? We quickly start writing off people. <sighs> or our enemy. That's exactly what happened to Jonah. Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, the arch enemy of Israel. That it was the capital city of the, of the, uh, of the northern, uh, what was it, the Assyrians up there. And he said, I'm not going to go there. I'm going the other way. He's writing them off. Condemnation of sinners. How about this? A casualness to soul winning. I know people that believe this way. And they very seldom give out the gospel to anyone. You know why? Well, God, God's going to choose them to be saved. They're going to get saved sometime. That's not what the Bible teaches. He said to Peter, after he began the church in Matthew 16, he said, Peter, I've given you the keys. You know what that means? Peter, I want you to go unlock the door and I want you to point to it and say, let me help you walk through the door. It's up to mankind to save. We're not, we don't do the saving, but it's us to point the way. You follow me on that? And when we get off track on this idea of election... We get a casualness to soul winning. We do. Say, is it really that big of a deal, preacher? Is it really life and death that I go out here and I give up my time to tell people about Jesus? Yes. I'm so glad somebody told me. Because I'm saved. Praise God. Hallelujah. So many of you in here had somebody knock on your door and tell you about Jesus. And you came and got saved. Praise God for that. Or maybe at a doorstep. I think about the time I was at my aunt's house when somebody came by and said, I'm going to share the word of God with you. And she got saved. I remember it. I was there. I was a little boy and I still had that memory of people coming to her house. Remember that. Lester Roloff said this, and we got to be done. I know I keep saying that, but I'm preaching. I'm having a good time. All right. Watch this now. Lester Roloff said this. If you want to save America, get saved. America saved. Our hope is not in November. I'm going to make a choice. I've already made the choice. I desire some things as an American. But that's not going to save America. You understand what I'm saying there? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And souls getting saved and churches booming and getting the gospel out in every dark corner of this nation. As Brother William says, Europe used to be have the gospel and used to send it out. America used to be the same way. But it's oftentimes you run into somebody who doesn't know anything about Jesus Christ. In this very auditorium right here, when I first became pastor, I had a child that didn't know who Jesus was. If you want to save America, get America saved. Let's bow together. Lord, help us, please. I'm thankful for a people 
that allow their pastor to give the message that you have given. And Lord, uh, even with the, the, just the time of the day and all these things, a little longer service today, but I thank you for what you are doing right now. Thank you for teaching us about the election of God. God, you chose me. May I rejoice in that. But God, at this, you all, I also chose you. You gave me that choice. Lord, I didn't just get saved because. It wasn't because of good works. It wasn't because of, uh, I've always been or my family's always been in some kind of church or, or because I was baptized as an infant. I didn't just get saved just because some, at some point, Lord, I made a choice and I remember asking you to save me. I pray, Lord, uh, there's some in here this morning that have received Christ already this morning. Lord, they came forward in a Sunday school hour and they received Jesus as their Savior. I pray that you give them the courage to come forward and make it known to the church. I pray for others here that are are questioning, am I really saved? Am I going to go to heaven or hell? What happens if I die today? Lord, may they come and say, what must I do to be saved? Lord, thank you for your word that's been preached. Thank you for the theme of the gospel that's been all throughout this morning already. And I pray that you'd work in hearts. Help us those that are saved, to understand that we can't get off on this area of election of God. Lord, we must be soul winners. We must carry the Word of God. We must show people to, to, uh, to point them to You. Lord, I'm thankful for the one that led me to Christ. Help us now this morning, please. We give You this invitation. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would You stand?